hello, welcome to this afternoon's uh, presentation on building hybrid cloud apps, combining local databases in the cloud for extreme versatility. My name is Mark Heckler. Um, I have worked for Oracle as a Java middleware core engineer. Uh, my background, my development background, just to give you a little bit uh, of a, a bio, uh, over 20 years of development experience in a variety of en environments, a variety of industries, uh, retail, financial, medical, um, government. Uh, that's where I spend most of my time nowadays, uh, working with uh, Java throughout the government, across, uh, across the organizations, uh, up and down throughout the entire stack. Uh, I will tell you this right up front, I don't work out of Oracle Corporate. I'm a field engineer. So you're not going to hear a lot of product-specific talk. You're going to hear a lot of idea-specific talk. Um, I spend my days with the customer, you guys. Uh, so I, I know what comes out of corporate, the ideas, the, the positioning, and all that's great, but all of us have to deal with the real world, how to make things work, how to start small, and, and introduce ideas and to see how it, it you know, shakes out uh, in, in the crucible of reality. So that's kind of where I'm coming from today. That and still trying to adjust to the controls. Okay. Now, I'll, I'll tell you up front, I brought a lot of notes because I didn't want to leave anything out, but this isn't well established for that, well set up for that. Uh, so I'm I may be doubling back at times to pick up on something I might, uh, might have missed. So anyway, our agenda today will include, but may not be limited to, uh, the following things. We're going to cover the session objectives, uh, what we hope to get out of it. Uh, we're going to be talking about what is the cloud uh, in practical terms for us, uh, where we are in relation to the cloud, how we can use the cloud to uh, meet real world needs. Uh, we'll do a little outside the box thinking, hopefully. And we'll do uh, some, uh, some live coding for the demo and then uh, talk, do a little Q&A, a little information exchange, idea exchange. And I'd kind of like to run this as a cross between a session and a birds of a feather because something like this, uh, it, it lends itself well to kind of throwing a lot of information out there and talking about it in a group. But there are times that you really don't want to talk about things in a group. You kind of want to pull off to the side and have a private conversation. So if everything works out, uh, okay, what I'd like to do is cover all of the, uh, the session, uh, you know, have that uh, little bit of public Q&A and then a little bit of private Q&A afterwards. So uh, let's give that a shot. So the session objectives. Again, this is idea-based. It's not product-based. Obviously, I use products to, to you know, show the, the example at the end, but uh, we're going to be talking more in the mind than in the, the screen. Uh, where are we now? Where do we want to be with regard to the cloud and how can we get there? Uh, we'll talk about one path. Uh, there are so many paths, so many options, so many uh, places you can go with this. Uh, and we'll show one prototype, very small scale prototype, um, a little contrived as most of them are, but uh, it might give you some ideas. And again, the, the purpose of this is to foster thought because today's solutions rarely fit tomorrow's problems. But if you start getting the ideas in place, a lot of times it, it allows you to, to be ahead of that curve when things happen. So, we'll start first with what is the cloud? Well, uh, I pulled out intentionally a very exhaustive definition from the U.S. Uh, National Institute for Standards and Technology. Uh, the high points, model for enabling ubiquitous, convenient on-demand network access, shared pool of uh, resources, whether it's uh, network servers, storage application services. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more later. Uh, rapidly provisioned, very little hands-on to get that uh, provisioned. Uh, five essential characteristics, three service models, four deployment models. It's an excellent, uh, excellent definition. It's an exhaustive definition. We'll cover all of that in depth now. I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. Let's skip to something a little more manageable. Uh, cloud computing is internet-based computing, whereby shared resources, software, and information are provided to computers and other devices on demand, like the electricity grid. Overused metaphor, but not bad. So let's take it a step further. Cloud computing is a general term for anything that involves delivering hosted services over the internet. And this is why we have the proliferation of marketing speak that we have, because pretty much anything you pull across the internet is cloud, uh, for better and worse. So for our purposes, what is it? Well, in the real world, we kind of have this 
dichotomy. We have companies, I don't want to give too much away, but we have, we have companies who want to be there. We have organizations who want to be in the cloud. Uh, but they still consider it somewhat unconventional, somewhat unorthodox. I mean, they've been doing things a certain way for years, and change comes uh, with some difficulty. So the, the cloud is a new way of doing things. It's something that uh, offers a lot of promise, and it threatens, uh, quite frankly. But every new tool brings new options, uh, solutions, and challenges. Let's break those challenges down into two sides, the technical and the non-technical challenges. Um, non-technical, legal, privacy, things like that. Um, I often tell people I don't ever want to trivialize the technical difficulties involved in implementing anything. But compared to the organizational and the legal issues and, and things of that nature, the technical side does kind of pale sometimes. So I, I want to address both. Because that's the world we live in. I mean, we can develop the best technical solution, and if we're not allowed to field it, we get nowhere with it. It doesn't want any good. So we can see the cloud from here, but most of us aren't in it. Not really, not fully. You know, uh, some of us have poked it with a stick. And I don't want to overgeneralize because some people are very much in the cloud. But I, I'm, not, I'm not talking so much to those folks. And, and again, I'll kind of loop back around and we'll, we'll cover that here shortly too. But uh, most of us can't be in it, not fully, not yet. And it, because there's some valid reasons for caution. And you're engineers. You probably can rattle off a half a dozen right now. Um, but we're not off the hook because we're supposed to solve problems. So we have opportunities, great. We have problems that come with them, great. Uh, but let me just ask a quick show of hands. Who here, whose organization is 100% in the cloud already? OK. Even your dev tools, everything? OK, yeah, that's kind of a trick question. Thanks for playing along. <laughs> I'll pay you off later. Uh, I don't know that we'll ever get 100% everything fully cloud-based, fully cloud-delivered. Maybe we will, but uh, we're certainly not there yet in, in most cases. Probably the closest that comes are small companies who are startups who, who spin up immediately. And uh, you know, due to some of the, the promises and the, uh, the opportunities that that offers without having to invest in a lot of infrastructure just to get off the ground, that you know, out of necessity sometimes they, they fall in there. Um, 50 to 100 percent? Organizations 50 to 100 percent in the cloud? Zero to 50? Zero to 25? Lower end? OK. That's, that's kind of what I expected. I mean, every, oh, let, let me ask this. Whose company or whose organization has stated they want to be in the cloud? OK. There are a few of you who didn't raise your hands. Why are you here? <laughs> uh, most companies, most organizations, uh, you know, whether it's, it's uh, you know, government, military, private, uh, large, bureaucratic, small, nimble, everybody has, has, everybody's at least informed to the point that they say, yeah, I think I want to be there. Uh, they, they may not know necessarily what it offers, but it's sort of like the Dilbert strip where the marketing folks get a hold of a magazine. Uh, you know, this is where we need to be. So we're headed that way. Sorry. We're headed that way. Uh, how do we get there? So first, let's start with the dark side of the cloud. Every cloud has a light side and a dark side. Let's talk about the bad stuff first. Well, the cloud, uh, like any other utility, has outages. And what happens, uh, I hope I'm not getting ahead of myself. Yeah, let's wing it. What, <laughs> what happens right now in your current environments, your in-house environments, when something goes south? Well, somebody typically gets a call, right? They get a page. Somebody's notified that something broke. And at that point, that person calls out the troops. Uh, maybe it's a database down. Maybe it's an application that goes offline, a website that goes dark. Somebody gets the call that something's broken. And then they call the essays, the DBAs, the ops managers, whoever, whomever needs to be involved in that as far up the chain as it needs to happen so that actions can be taken. Uh, the, the backups brought online, the, the failover site engaged. Hopefully that's all automatic, but again, things happen. What happens in the cloud? And I know I'm getting ahead of myself here, but uh, what the heck, we'll take things a little out of sequence. What happens in the cloud? If you have a, an infrastructure in the cloud, your data in the cloud, what happens then? What happens when there's a, an outage? What do you do when there's an outage? 
not really much of anything. I mean, you engage a point person a lot of times to work with that provider, but what do you do? You wait for the call. You wait to see something come back on again. You, you cry, you pray, you do whatever you need to do. Yeah, you drink a lot, yeah, okay. Um, but you do, it, it's a different feel, and it's a, a kind of a powerless feel. Uh, again, kind of coming back to, let's see if I can get this to work. Yes, okay. Uh, cloud failures cost more than 70 million since 2007. These are the kind of headlines that keep you up at night. Uh, five serious cloud failures and disasters just of last year. Amazon cloud outage causes customer to leave. Ouch. Um, companies making the news for cloud failures. Amazon, Google, Heroku, Hosting.com, Twitter, Microsoft, Netflix, PayPal. Oracle's not up there. But they're just getting started, so I, I have no doubt. It's early. They'll be there. Anybody have a guess on the estimated cost of an outage? A lot of people don't talk about this, but the, the numbers that you can find when you can find them are somewhere between $200,000 and $225,000 per hour in cost. Uh, so, you know, the, the probably four or five months ago, there was an Amazon Web Services outage that uh, cascaded across multiple zones. Uh, a lot of companies, or a few companies anyway, were out over 24 hours, so that's about $5 million right out of the pocket. Just something to think about. Okay. Other reasons for caution. Well, privacy concerns, legal concerns. Uh, legal and regulatory restrictions are real, real and actual concerns that have to be addressed. And a lot of times as developers, we don't think about those, but I guarantee you someone is. And they're the ones who can put the brakes on any kind of activity that you're doing to, to get to help move your company in, in some way, large or small, to the cloud. Um, in the US, we have regulatory guidance like FISMA and HIPAA and SOX, cool acronyms. Uh, the uh, EU has the Data Protection Directive. You have uh, industry guidelines and regs uh, that, I shouldn't say regs, but they're guidelines that, that typically industry consortia adhere to, uh, like the, uh, what is it, the Payment Control Industry uh, Data Security Initiative or something like that. PCI DSS, I think is what the acronym is. Uh, and that doesn't even begin to cover what happens when you cross national boundaries. Because if you, and I'll constantly be referring back to data, because working with the government, you hear a term a lot called data at rest. When you, when you have an application, that's, that's very temporal. So if, if I'm using an application, I don't care where the server is based, where the real concern is is when that data is stored, when that persistence is engaged. Because if I, as a US citizen, have my data stored in a server in Ireland, or an Irish citizen has their data stored in a New Zealand server, New Zealand, a New Zealander or a Kiwi has their, uh, their data stored in India or China or Canada or anything like that, you're not just dealing with your national standards, your national laws and regulations, you're dealing with the other nations. And a lot of times your nation will pass laws that specifically address what happens when your data is stored out of country. So you've got this kind of multi-tiered mess that you're dealing with. Uh, okay, exposure and security. That's, that's real and perceived uh, because some people view the cloud as fairly secure. However, most people view the cloud as somehow less secure legitimately so in, in most cases, than what's behind their firewall, what's in their data center. So those are issues that we have to address. Uh, different cloud providers, just like um, different networks, different uh, wireless and wired networks have different security models, different security levels, different risk levels. Um, and with different uh, cloud providers and now open providers coming online, you, you almost have to study, well, you do have to study each one to see what you're getting into what they address well, what they don't address so well. Uh, management mandate. You have uh, some leaders of some organizations, and I use that term both with some sarcasm, but, but they, uh, some leaders will advocate a strong move to the cloud. Some leaders will actually uh, insist that they somehow have a, a competitive advantage, that they're, they're more secure. They'll point out competitors who are you know, flagrantly throwing everything in the cloud, potentially without keeping your best interest at, at heart. These are things that are a little tougher to deal with because that kind of gets into that organizational side of things that you have to address in order to be able to implement your solutions. Okay, reliability and control issues. Well, we've talked about that to some degree. Um, the client company really doesn't have the ability to control uh, much of anything in terms of when there's a failure, when there, whenever there's an outage. <coughs> Make sense so far? Yes, no? Okay. 
All right. Continuing. Still on the dark side. Uh, the top quote that I have there is, is from the Oracle Prophet magazine. And I, it surprised me a little bit when I saw it in there too. Uh, but it's from a local government IS person's perspective. Uh, who, by the way, uh, implemented a private cloud. And he points out that uh, utilizing the private cloud is a good middle ground between placing assets in a public cloud where you don't have much security or control versus doing everything on your own. And everything's relative again, but there is a, a distinction there. Uh, Larry Ellison famously just yesterday made the comment that there are some environments due to legal and regulatory issues that you won't be able to put your things in a public cloud. If Larry acknowledges it, it's got to be true, right? So Oracle is making a push toward a private cloud that matches, that mirrors the public cloud. Don't know much about that, can't tell you. But uh, again, it's, it's widely recognized. There are concerns. Um, how do you fix that? How do you fix things when they go wrong? Well, we talked about that. There's, you don't really have hands-on in most cases. Uh, there are avoidance and detection examples. And Netflix is probably the, the best example of that because they've pioneered so much and because they're so open with communicating that and sharing that. Uh, they have a, a tool called Chaos Monkey, which actively goes out and breaks things. And, and what they've done is get ahead of that wave. They're not fighting failure, they're embracing failure. And they're trying to get out ahead of that curve, dealing with things versus fixing things, sort of like judo versus karate, you know, kind of flowing with it. Uh, so it's a failure embracing system. We recognize there'll be failures, we'll plan around them, we'll architect around them, and, and we'll minimize their impact. Take advantage of all the benefits and try to avoid all the pitfalls. A uh, couple more articles, top 10 reasons for not using the cloud. That's actually from about four years ago, but most of it's uh, eerily um, current. The second one kind of recaps what the other one uh, says. Okay, so with all that bad sitting out there, yes? <laughs> Which cloud do you want? What, I'm sorry? <laughs> okay, the, the comment was, one thing missing, which cloud do you want, VHS or beta? We're going to kind of cover that. In fact, I, I, I'm glad you pointed that out because, uh, you know, in my, in my notes, uh, which I, I'm trying not to go, because I just think it'd be too much of a distraction, you hear a lot about infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, data as a service, uh, security as a service, storage as a service. I mean, everything that pretty much, everything that you use can be delivered in some capacity sometimes better than others, as a service via the cloud, whether it's a private cloud or a public cloud or some kind of an amalgam of both. Uh, so there are a lot of different, um, different packages out there. There are a lot of different terms and solutions and boundaries. And by the way, one thing that makes this so incredibly difficult is that the boundaries are really fluid. And the terms are really fluid. So, and again, I don't want to give too many spoilers, but at the end, I'm going to bend one of those boundaries a little bit and uh, show you what I mean by that. But uh, everything is still very much in flux. You know, the cloud has been talked about by the marketing folks for years now, but where are we? I mean, Oracle is just now getting things off the ground. Uh, the cloud's not new, but it's still really considered emerging tech and probably will be for the, for the foreseeable future. You look puzzled. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right. So, we're not off the hook. Yes, uh, cloud in general has, has downsides, but we solve problems. That's what we do. That's our field. So, what are some of the benefits? Let's look at the light side of the cloud. Well, uh, you and your customers, and I say this, a lot of you folks are my customers. But you have customers, internal customers, external customers. We all have customers. And, and at the end of the day, we've got to make it right for them. So what are the benefits? Well, first of all, you and your customers can access things in the cloud from nearly anywhere. It, it breaks down a lot of boundaries. Uh, you can make things available to your customer quickly with no, minimal or no additional setup or configuration. Uh, if, you're, if you're working within the cloud, and again, I'll use that fairly flexibly, um, <laughs> But if you're working within a cloud type of environment, uh, gone are the days that you have to, uh, for standing up a, a, whether it's a small system or a large system, you're, you don't have to spec your server, you don't have to put in a purchase request, wait for it to be delivered, 
uh, find a rack to put it in, make sure your power is adequate, stand it up, install everything, configure it, test it, get it past network security, and start loading your application. Now, at some level, yes, you do, but when it comes to a cloud-based solution, uh, it's incremental. So if, if the things are already in place and you need to add additional resources, it's very low impact. Capacity can vary as demand varies. Uh, some of you are probably in industries where you have a peak time. Most of you probably have a peak time. Some, sometimes they're big peaks, sometimes they're not so big. But let's use retail as an example. December, oh my goodness. Your, your capacity may have to be 10 times what it is in June. What do you do? What do you do now with your existing setup? You have to accommodate that peak capacity plus some buffer, right? So if your capacity has to be 10 times in December what it is in June, you're probably going to be about 12 times higher capacity than you are most of the year, than you need with your current setup. With cloud computing, you can incrementally add resources, you can pay for them when you need them, bring them back offline, things scale down when you don't. Uh, and I, I kind of throw it at the end, innovation happens in new areas, and again, the cloud isn't new, but, but still for most of us, as we saw from the hands, it's fairly new within our organization. So, uh, if you're going to solve new problems, if you're going to advance new solutions, you're going to have to do it with some, some new tools. Okay, first off, how do, we, how do we go forward with that? Well, I think the first thing that's important for us uh, on the tech side, engineering and IT, to admit to our leadership is, is that the cloud is, is not an all or nothing solution. We don't have to flip the switch, you know, shut off everything tonight and be 100% in the cloud tomorrow. Most of us cannot do that. We'll, we'll take incremental steps, baby steps. We'll do some tests, some proofs of concepts. We'll see how things shake out. We'll build on our successes. We'll fix our failures and make successes out of them. So how do you eat an elephant? Well, one bite at a time. Uh, and, and really the key is, like I said earlier, to find those requirement holes and fill them. Okay, if a little's good, a lot's better, right? Well, again, no. Uh, because one tool doesn't do everything. One solution doesn't fit every problem, one size doesn't fit all. And there are going to be times when legally you cannot implement a cloud solution. So we're okay with that. We're all okay with that, right? Okay, we're not okay with that, but we're going to deal with that. Okay, is there a balance point and how do you find it? Well, every environment's different, every company, every program, every, every data center, so it's going to still take some thought. Again, getting back to those ideas. So, requirements. If I come to you, if I'm a user and I come to you with a requirement and you tell me you can't fulfill it, what happens to that requirement? If I say, I need this because our external customers are demanding this. I've got to be able to provide this. And, and you can't give me a solution, what happens? The requirement doesn't go away. It's not fulfilled. It doesn't go away. It's just now in the head of a newly disgruntled user. Now I'm going to go and grumble because IT or engineering, they're not cooperating. They're not giving me what, what we want. We're losing market share because they're not giving us uh, the, the, the way forward. So um, requirements are the key to cloud adoption, really. Uh, if, if you've had trouble advancing uh, any kind of cloud development or any kind of cloud solutions within your, your organization, when you show how that fulfills a valid requirement, uh, and I'll touch on that a little bit later as well, when you show how that fulfills a valid requirement, that's the key to moving forward within your organization. So the bottom point, how do we fulfill the requirement while managing risks? Well, we already do that. With our existing solutions, we balance risk and reward. We show how to fill those needs and mitigate risk, manage risk, minimize risk. So this is really no different. We're just using a different platform to get it done. We have to show our, our leadership how a cloud solution solves the problem at hand better than other options. Not just solving the problem because every problem has multiple solutions. Some are better than others. We need to show how this is better. Uh, how are we gonna meet the requirement and maintain or even optimally improve our risk profile? Because if we meet the requirement and incre increase our risks, introduce additional risks, that's going to be a non-starter too. 
and as tech folk, we need to be sure and let leadership know that we're not just using the, the buzzword of the day, the silver bullet. We're not going to throw this at everything. We're going to use the tool where it makes sense. So how do we get there? Well, I'm a big proponent in starting small and building out because that lets all of your stakeholders see how a solution fits a problem, how it can be leveraged to, uh, to maybe address more than one problem, and how it is workable within your organization without a whole lot of impact. Um, realizing the following points. Well, first of all, your first time out of the gate, even with a small example, you're probably not going to get it right. You're probably not going to wow anybody. Uh, it's, it, it may fail. Big deal. You know, every time we implement a new technology, a new tool, a new process, there are going to be bumps. Uh, so failures uh, produce improvements. Turn those failures into successes. When you have successes, use those to build on and make more successes. Build from small to large. Now, that doesn't mean to dive into the tinker toys without planning. That means to start small, use a small example that, you know, very limited in focus, and, and build out from there. One of my favorite quotes, you, probably, you guys have probably heard of James Gosling, right? In the lab, failure is positive. If everything you try works, it means you're too careful that you aren't taking any risks. To fail is to learn. Uh, and that goes outside the lab, because if you're not reaching, you're not improving anything. But on the downside, to the man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And you ladies aren't off the hook either, because if you're around with a hammer, it's all going to look like nails too. Um, we have to be careful, again, not to just blanket use it. And I know I, you're hearing me use the term cloud a lot today just because that's the presentation. But if we run around all day, every day saying cloud, 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 nobody's going to listen to us for very long anyway. So, OK. Yes, we're, we're going to get back to this. Um, about that balance point. Well, we talked about the different as a services, but we also have different configurations or levels of cloud. So you have the public cloud. And today, within this context, really we consider the public cloud any cloud-based resources outside of your company. Uh, the private cloud we'll consider as any uh, cloud-based resources within your company boundaries and fully under your control. Everybody's still upright. That's good. OK. Not here. Hybrid cloud, some mix of both. <coughs> so the hybrid cloud. And again, that's kind of where we can take things today. We have a large, most of us have a large investment in infrastructure, a large investment in how we do things today. We're not going to shut that off tonight. It's just not realistic. So a hybrid cloud provides the flexibility of in-house applications with the fault tolerance and scalability of cloud-based services. Now, to back up a little bit, I know that not everything you have in-house is cloud-based. But the concept's still the same. I mean, we're still talking about multiple mirrors in your car. If you have one mirror, you have a lot of blind spots. If you have multiple mirrors, you, you reduce the number of blind spots that you have. And that's the goal, to cover more of the field of vision and reduce those blind spots. Uh, the second one is actually from an Oracle publication. The first one wasn't. Uh, hybrid clouds offer the flexibility and cost savings of the public cloud along with security and data protection of the private cloud. So remember the whole data at rest thing. We'll talk a little bit more, too, about data partitioning as we go along. Uh, but the bottom article, um, drunk on cloud Kool-Aid, time to sober up. Sounds really ominous. It was written by the CEO of a cloud company. Uh, same thing, though. Uh, you, you find that a lot of terms and a lot of ideas are kind of hijacked by the marketing folks, and people go into them blindly. Maybe they don't have the optimal experience, and they run away. So again, go in, eyes open. OK, remember the requirements we talked about earlier. Uh, typically, where you can leverage a new solution, a new tool, a new process, in this case, some kind of a cloud-based initiative, is via an edge case, via a requirement that uh, before you might have had to turn away. An edge case doesn't mean something that's rare or unusual. A lot of times edge cases happen with frequency and regularity. Uh, maybe they're only 10 or 5 or 20 percent of the time. Maybe you have such a backlog of things that you need to get done that you just kind of push them aside for the quick kills, for the, the low-hanging fruit, the easy victories, whatever your organization calls them, uh, like there are any real easy victories. Um, 
But those edge cases are really key to, to starting new initiatives, to solving those new problems, and for dipping your toe into the shallow end of, of cloud computing. They provide excellent opportunities to prototype. Uh, when you do this right, everyone can and should win, and it should be with a fairly small amount of, of effort and pain and cost. And again, there will be failures. That's fine. One size doesn't fit all. The normal caveats apply. So getting to the demo. Uh, let's talk about our goals with the demo first. And um, then we'll get into a little bit of uh, live code, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But before we do that, let's talk about our basic overarching goals. Well, all the illities, really. We should have the usability. It should be usable or reachable, at least the functionality that we want to expose from elsewhere, from outside. Uh, maintainability and flexibility, it should use standards so that it, we're not locked into any particular uh, library way of doing things, things like that. Uh, it should be scalable. Uh, it should be available and reliable. Okay, hard to argue with that. Extensibility. Um, we should be able to add on resources as we need to, remove them as, as we don't. Uh, the security, we should be able to leverage some cloud provider security, SSL, and whatever the cloud provider provides on top of in addition to and around. And it should be portable. Hard to argue with any of that, right? Okay, the Mighty Bean Coffee Company. We're serious about our Java. Couldn't see that one coming, right? Um, the example we're going to use, that I'm going to use, is built using the following components. I use NetBeans. You can use anything you want to, but I like NetBeans. Uh, Glassfish will be used for our um, app server. Java server faces for the, uh, the web application. I also, and, and again, this is a very small contrived example, but I wanted to try to break things out and show you, give you a little taste of uh, uh, using JavaFX uh, to access both local and cloud stores. MySQL is the local database that I'm using behind the scenes. Uh, I've done this a couple times. I've used Oracle Database Express Edition. It doesn't really matter what your back end is locally. It could be Oracle Database ex uh, Enterprise Edition or anything else. Uh, but for today, it's MySQL. And our cloud provider for today is Evernote. And Evernote is typically considered a software as a service type of platform, but it has a, a rather nice API. So, uh, and it's great for prototyping. If you notice all of these things, what's your total cost for your license to top to bottom to spin up a quick prototype? Zero. So you've already taken that objection out of, out of leadership's hands. So you're not going to cost them anything to spin up something and try it out. Um, at least on the small scale. So, uh, let's build. And let's see. Oh, actually I do want to say, uh, get back to this. I do want to say one thing first. The, the example that we're going to do, I'll give you a little background, a little table setting. Uh, the Mighty Bean Coffee Company is an, a very well old established company, at least on paper. Uh, it's a wholesaler. It sells coffee to coffee retailers. And like many companies who, have, uh, who are in the wholesale business, it's very traditional. They have sales folks who go out and meet. They call, whatever. They take orders from customers, but they validate them and enter them into the system themselves. So everything's pretty much internal. And everything's very secure. It's never been exposed to the outside world. But somebody within Mighty Bean has seen the, the writing on the wall, and they want to be able to, uh, at, at the very least, in a test case, to be able to let their customers know what the order was that they just placed. And they want to be able to deliver that w without opening up their firewall to, the, to every customer from the outside. They also want to be able to, if, if wishes were fishes, to allow that customer to go back and say, you know, I ordered five pounds of espresso roast. I, re I really want seven. And to be able to bring that back in to the local database, fulfill the order, and push it out the door. So again, small example, but that's what we're going to work through. Make sense? Okay, let's see if the demo gods are kind today. Um, so, to start with, we'll do a uh, quick little web application. Oh good, you're seeing that, that's good. And we'll call that Java One Web. Nothing too fancy. We'll be using JSF. And 
it already. Uh, let's see, let's change this to something a little more. Okay, already we now have a workable app. It doesn't do anything, but it's there. Okay, so that's good. That's a good start. Demo gods are happy so far. So, what do we do next? Well, if you're in your corporate environment as we laid out, the first thing you've got to do is get to your existing data, right? You have your systems in place. You want to be able to tie into what you have in place. So, let's create some entity classes from our database. Easiest way to do that, point to a data source, add them in. We have four key tables for the, for the purposes of this demo. First is a customer table, self-explanatory. Then you have the coffees. These are the, the products that we offer to our customers. You have the coffee order. That, in effect, is a header for the order that lets you know who ordered what, when, and what your total is. And uh, well, I shouldn't say what, because the what is really a joined table. It's the coffees that are on that coffee order. And this is where, you, when you have joined tables, the, the JSF generation isn't so pretty. But again, for the example, it, it's sufficient. It allows you also to rename your classes that, that uh, correspond to your, your tables. We're not going to do that. Not for the demo. Nope. Yep. And we'll put them in an entity package. Yeah, stay with the defaults. Everything should be fine there. So what this is going to do for us now is create some POJOs, which correspond to our tables underneath. Still doesn't really get us anywhere. But that's the next step. And you create some JSF pages from the, uh, from the entity classes. So we'll add all of those. And we'll just change the uh, packages so we don't dump everything into the same spot. But it generates our session beans. And again, a very nice start. And our JSF pages. So as you can see, and this is one of the reasons I like NetBeans, most IDEs have some way of doing some of the heavy lifting, but it just works really well. Um, I also, and just as kind of a side plug for NetBeans, if anybody's not using it, uh, I had used it years ago, switched away from it, came back to it, and was just thrilled. Uh, ran into an issue, uh, ironically, on this. It was a uh, join table issue on the code generation when CDI is engaged. Uh, and, and there's a, a bug with the uh, current code generation. I wasn't even sure it was a bug, but the NetBeans team start to finish from identifying it, confirming it, fixing it, releasing workarounds, and in integrating it into the next code release. Uh, 7.3 is when it'll come out. Uh, less than 24 hours. And that is just incredibly responsive. So, uh, you know, if you haven't used it, there's, there's my little commercial plug. I guess it is a little about product. But, um, but again, uh, no, no charge open source product. So what do we have so far? Let's go ahead and run this. As you can see, it added some things. So now we have links. We can go out and take a look at our customers. Oh, good, it works. Uh, you just never know. Everything can work until you set it up here and plug everything in. Uh, we have our list of, of our products that we offer, our coffees. Uh, we have our coffee orders. We just have a few, so we're probably not going to be in business long. But, and we have our coffee orders, or coffees that are on the coffee orders. Again, not sorted, nothing pretty, but it's out there. So, okay. Now, in the interest of time, you know how on cooking shows, they show you all the ingredients that go in, they show you how to mix it all up, and then they stick it in the oven, and then they grab the other oven door, and they pull out, and the finished product is out here. That's what we're about to see here. So, it's just faster that way. But it's pretty much the same thing, really. Um, so... So far, it, what I've shown you is just the local side of it. So how do you integrate the cloud? Well, again, this is a very, very small example, but what happens with those, those coffee orders? Um, when you, if you want to go out and validate your coffee order, let's go in and view it. And I didn't show you this in the other one, actually, but oh well. Uh, here's what happens. You now can see your header and your lines. Nothing very fancy, but what happens before this is shown is it goes out and reconciles your cloud order and your local order. Here's the order that's sitting out there in the cloud. And again, this is just Evernote, nothing fancy. Um, but 
what that does, it, your business rules will dictate how you handle that. In this case, we're fairly trusting, so we just, uh, we just bring it down and make everything match. But let's say, for instance, that, uh, let's see, coffee order one, let's edit that. And instead of three, we want seven. Okay. Now, if you look at here in the order, we're still showing three. Okay, that's not, not terribly earth shattering here. But let's go back to here and pull in this. And again, no, no gatekeeping whatsoever. We pull down three. Because what we're doing is overriding our, our local storage with what's out in the cloud. That's just the business rules as they stand right now. Probably not something you want to implement. But that keeps things synchronized. So let's switch gears here really quickly and <coughs> go out and we will edit this and change that to a nine. We want a lot of espresso roast. I'm so bummed. I brought in a coffee to drink while I was doing this and it disappeared before I even started. So otherwise, what's that? <laughs> Not that fast. Oh. <laughs> Probably good. We would have gone through this whole thing in 10 minutes. But uh, anyway, so we see that the customer, now I'm the customer out there. I look, go out and look at my order. I say, wow, I only ordered three of those. I know I told him nine. I changed it to nine. So we go back here and eh, we'll take a look here. It's now nine. Okay, nothing magical there. Agreed. But now we go over to the other side of the house and we look at the JavaFX side. Anybody work with JavaFX here as well? Wow, not, not much at all. JavaFX is the, uh, I guess here's the other little commercial plug. JavaFX is a rich application interface. Uh, you know, the old swing days, the battle days of swing. Uh, those are gone. JavaFX is much lighter. It's, it's uh, network capable, network deliverable. Uh, it's, it's really nice, much lighter weight. Uh, so if you were hoping for a quick peek at that, you're about to get it. If not, well, you're going to get it anyway. So let's say, for our example, that we, we can do all of this, but what happens in the morning when our shipping people come in? They want to pull up and reconcile the orders. Wow, that was fast. See what I mean? They want to reconcile the orders and they want to verify everything is right before they pack it and ship it. So here we have a little utility and it was very quick and easy to create using, I don't think I used anything but standard controls out of the box. Uh, but this is a JavaFX program that, again, the shipping people are going to run, they're going to take a look through these, and they're going to be able to compare the local and the cloud orders. Here we see that there's a distinction, nine versus three. What way do we want to go? Well, again, this comes down to business rules, and this is why we talk about that aspect of, of development so much versus just the development, as much fun as that is. Because your business rules are going to determine how you proceed. Maybe they call and verify with the, the salesperson. Maybe they call the customer. Maybe they just overwrite. But either way, you can either push what the values are behind your firewall, or you can pull that information down. Now, why is this important? And, and, and I hope I haven't lost anybody with this, because this does tend to get a little weedy. But why is this important? You have data partitioning. Because if you look at what's stored out there, there's nothing that's what's called personally identifiable information, PII. Uh, and again, in working with the government, they get very, they, they want data. They want data everywhere. They want to be able to access it from anywhere. The more data, the better. But it cannot be identifiable if it's intercepted. And that makes a lot of sense, not just in public sector, but in private sector. So heaven forbid you have a, a you, you have some kind of a security breach with your cloud provider. What are they going to learn from the information on the right? Well, not a lot. They're going to learn that a customer has an order with some stuff on it. So even though we're isolating customers from seeing each other's data, if something breaks down, they're still not going to get any valuable intel on any other customer. So that's, that's the goal. Now, which way do you want to go? From the right, obviously. It has to be the right. From the right. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. This is a perfect illustration of the caching problem. Of the ca caching? Yeah, you have to okay. cache here. Um, the last updated version is not in both places. So this is actually to be solved by developers. How are we going to fix that? 
Developers, yes, but using what? Using the rules that are typically put in place by the business. Because let's say, for instance, Well, it's not, it's let, like, okay, if I'm the local guy in the local office and I took from the customer problem and I changed it, it should be reflected in you in the cloud. Okay, I'm let me in the cloud and I'm doing it over there, it should be reflected in you in the local. Let me let me throw out an example. Oh well I'll I'll throw that I'll throw out an example and see what you think of that. Let's say instead of nine and three, it's nine and nine hundred and eighty. The most anybody's ever ordered from us has been 10 packages or something. Now I see a 980. What am I going to do? It's the last one in. Do I just blindly take it? Do I put a man in the middle, person in the middle? What are my business rules? So you're right. I mean, you have to establish some kind of rules, and as developers, we're the folks who implement those. But other folks are going to have a chop on that as well. So that's why, you know, again, we all have to hold hands and sing together, and it all has to, to work out at the end, because otherwise we're out the door with a severance check, right? So, so that's why. So in this case, Mighty Bean feels like their shipping people should be able to verify it before they do anything. In this case, we'll say that, yes, that looks valid. We know this customer. They frequently change their order and drive us crazy, so we'll push that out. And I'll, I'll hold, hold that thought. Um, another quick little plug, one of the other things that I've done, I do uh, contribute to open source projects as much as I can. This is DialogFX and JFextras via JavaFX. That's something that, that uh, I've contributed to the community, so yeah. plug, plug, plug. Uh, over at the local order values, yes, okay, so now we see they match. We, okay, yes? So the question is like, uh, what is the system of record, you know, local database or the cloud database? Normally, system of record. Oh, oh. <sighs> well. You're saying that, I mean, here is one example you showed. Right. The, the guys yes. in, the, in the warehouse are not even guests. Again, well, again, and, and these, yeah, they both do tie together. Again, what's your system of record? How, <laughs> it's whatever your organization defines it to be. And, and this is the kind of thing that drives me crazy, too, because, again, I work with the government, and, and this is a constant source of, of turmoil, because for this key piece of data, this is your system of record. For this key piece of data, that's a system of record. And yet, you find that even though that's a system of record, this becomes an authoritative source. Go figure. So I, I can't answer that for you. Now, coming back to, I'm sorry, what, what were you saying? So what's the source of truth? Well, and again, all that can be solved if you just force a reconciliation. What, what he's saying, though, is the guy that entered the order, he, he, entered, he entered nine, but he accidentally forgot to uncheck case. So he ordered nine cases, which is some huge amount that no one and you've got a valid point. Right. Yeah, I, your point's completely valid. My, my statement, though, is that I can't answer that for you because that ultimately comes down to how your organization did, wants to deal with that, how they demand you deal with that. But, but as architects and developers, we're not supposed to contribute to the problems. We're supposed to solve these problems. And we shouldn't design a system that's going to have that built in. I, I hear you. That's all I'm asking you. I hear you. Um, I, I just, and, and your organization may be different, but I just know that. Well, they're, they're going to hire me to come fix that. <laughs> or they'll hire you to. I mean, that represents work for me because you didn't. Or they'll, or they'll hire you to implement it. And, and again, I. Okay. Well, let me just put it this way. It's a demo. It's a prototype. It's a contrived example. I said that up front. Don't crucify me. Uh, <laughs> so however you work it out with your organization, that's great. I just know working with the government customers, and it's bananas. I'm not going to argue with that. But you, you, you have to meet certain 
directives. You have to meet certain dictates. And, and if they tell you that it has to be this way and you have to insert somebody in the middle as a gatekeeper of a process, whether it's a guy in a warehouse or whether it's you know, the guy in the corner office, that better be there or they'll bring in somebody else who will. So you're right, data inconsistency, logical inconsistencies, all bad things. But if there is a process in place that requires an intervention, you have to work around that. So anyway, that's, okay, uh, that's just a demo, it's just a prototype. Yeah, so anyway, <laughs> any other group questions before we break up and just uh, if you want to come on offline? Yes? How's the job talking to database? Um, glad you asked that. Gosh, I skipped past that too because I didn't, didn't use my papers. Um, Evernote has an API that they expose, uh, several different languages, several different mechanisms, but as a jar. Uh, they also use Apache Thrift as the transport uh, mechanism. I wrote, uh, just, and again, it's an open source library, I threw it out there, which bundles and unbundles orders. Oh, gosh, I need to get back to this really quickly. Um, Sorry. Right. <laughs> that's all right. Yeah, I'm flustered. Yeah, my fault, I, I asked for questions. Um, Okay, here's really all that's involved in this. I, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very similar setup, but uh, on, the, on the web app you have a cloud bean. All that does is interact with your cloud store using libraries. And, and the same thing with JavaFX, I, I effectively use the same libraries. Uh, I have an integrator class which reconciles the local and cloud data. And again, in some cases, I make that automatic. It, and in the other case, I don't. I insert that person in the middle. Again, two different examples. Um, Composite order represents that built coffee order, the header and the information on it. Uh, the ENML lib, that's the library that I created, it's open source. If anybody's interested in that, it's nothing terribly fancy, it just functions. Uh, but if anybody's interested in it, uh, hit me on Twitter and uh, I'll, I'll try to get it out on GitHub in the next several days, but I gotta sleep first. <laughs> um, just a, it's effectively an interface class and then the, uh, the functionality to bundle and unbundle and manipulate the data, add headers, things like that. Uh, and then, as I said, the current Evernote API library and the Thrift library. Um, and we're pretty much out of our discussion time, at least publicly. Uh, I'm, I write the Java Jungle through Oracle's blog system. Um, if you're interested, I kind of cover, again, all across the map, small things, large things. You know, I, I, I try to put them in bite-sized topics, but I, you know, it's everything from just little uh, syntactical things through, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, key examples, things like that. Uh, I'm also on Twitter. Please feel free to follow me and uh, we'll carry on the discussion later. But if anybody wants to just come up and, and noodle a bit or maybe, you know, talk in the hallway, that's great. Come on up. But thank you for attending. Uh, good luck.